I enjoy these programs. Uh, the lecture series at the Single Tax Do is really, uh, it's a good program. Every one of these are very good. Not just mine, but all the others. They're all good. That was my joke for the evening. But what my joke was going to be, uh, this is one of my favorite ties, and it started to unravel, and I started sewing it down here, and when I get down here, it has a Donald Trump logo on it. So that's, that's, my, that's my joke for the evening. Um, uh, tonight I'm going to talk about the founding of Fairhope exhibit that we have over the museum. Our museum is doing real, nec real good next door. Uh, most all of you have been there. Half of you work there. So, uh, so there, you, you know that we have a, a real good museum. We, we're about 23, 24,000 people come through our museum a year. Uh, mostly tourists come there to find out about Fairhope. We have excellent displays, you know, to tell them about Fairhope. We have a, um, a, a great s staff of docents that, that work the museum, and uh, we're always needing more docents. If you, if you want to come and meet the 24,000 tourists that come to our city, please come and uh, talk to us about being a docent. We have a friends organization. The friends organization does all kinds of things at our museum. Such as just yesterday, we turned on our, our Technicolor laser light show in our fountain out here. So when y'all leave today, like me, see it for the first time in the dark, uh, see our, um, our uh, light show that we have out back. Uh, the, we're going to be able to uh, make it pink during October month. We're we going to make it blue and, and we're going to make it strobe. I can, I can see it, you know, going with ZZ Top. So we're going to have that thing going pretty soon. Right now we don't know how to work it really. But anyway, that's a lot of things that the docents do, and uh, including building our People's Railroad uh, this past year. Just many, many projects we do, and we have many, many more coming up. Uh, be sure and step in the museum and get our flyer, our, fr our, our friends' newsletter, to tell about all the activities that our friends do, which is... Uh, very, very busy and quite, quite impressive. Uh, but we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the founders exhibit that we have upstairs. Upstairs, we generally change that out every year, uh, telling a different story. Uh, last year, it was the Bay Boats. Uh, a great story about the Bay Boats and uh, Pico Forsman's wonderful models. Really was a great exhibit. I certainly hated to take it down, like all the exhibits. I hate to take them down. The year before that was Civil War, one of my favorites. I just hated to take that down. Uh, and I will hate to take this one down, too. But um, it, it's the one on the, uh, the founders of Farrell. And the idea of this came out of, um, out of a, a play that we were doing. It was called the Roundup Play. Uh, when they came to Fairhope, E.B. Gaston's bunch of single taxers or, or populists was calling uh, the, the, the day to come to Fairhope Roundup Day. And so that's what we called it, Roundup Day. And we did, a, we twice, two, for two years we did it in the museum because it was really uh, bad weather. And then for the next two years we did it out in the cemetery and did a play. And at the end of the cemetery in the very back, across that back uh, road there, conveniently spaced is all the, the, the town founders, you know, laying there in, in chronological order. It's great how they are. And, and so we would tell the story from uh, stage uh, left to stage right and just go along the line telling that story. We got people in costumes and people that were, uh, that were um, kind of well versed in what they were doing. Around the museum, they started talking in first person about you know, like Mr. Greeno, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Gaston were, were fighting constantly in the museum in, in first person character. And uh, they really got to know their roles real well. There's a whole bunch of men here. And, and we were just blessed from our lucky stars because uh, John Woods came along and he said, we can make a movie out of that. That sounds good. So. Um, so it took us all last year of takes and retakes and takes and retakes. You know, the first time you do it looked just as good as the second time you do it. And you know how these movie people are, do it again, why? Do it again, why? It looked just, you know, you do it over and over and over and over and over. And, uh, and the editing was wonderful. Uh, Gary Scoville did uh, the editing. He made us look good. You know, when you uh, say, uh, and go a lot of, uh, he just cut those right out and made us look like professional actors and actresses and just made us look good. 
Thank you guys, y'all uh, made us a wonderful program. But we're gonna show you a little bit of that tonight. Uh, for the advertisement, uh, they have made a trailer, so I'm gonna show you the trailer. Our play takes place in the Fairhope Colony Cemetery and gives us a glimpse into all that had been accomplished by 1904, 10 years after the city was founded. We came here with a very simple motto, we will make good theories work. And we're enjoying being part of this fair hope of success. They come on these bay boats from Mobile. The boats are full of people who come here who want to... Sadly, John was found dead. Of my 12 other brothers and sisters, Dr. Clara and I remain very close. We're not that close. I don't like all this political chatter, and I'm tired of it and I'm resigning from this whole thing. Fair Hope is a place where a woman of my free persuasion can live in peace. I have been known to bathe in the bay without the benefit of a bathing suit. Women should be free to live, love, imbibe, and play in happy surroundings. And I'm finding that Fair Hope is my utopia. You know, I doubt that very many people know that you led Union soldiers in the Civil War. It's true. It's true. In, in fact, you came to us as a hero. Well, thank you very much. I yes. And now you are a kicker. We now know you belong to the leaseholders' uh, protective union. You're nothing but a bunch of royalists, socialists. Perhaps if you had studied, you know, Henry George's work more carefully, oh, I read you Henry would know George's that the rent is established here. upon the, the land I value, not a man's ability such, to this pay. Is such a Fake ideal and idealistic. Uh, it, it won't work, it hasn't worked, and it's never gonna work. Honestly, you know, you kickers are all alike. All you know how to do is kick. Well, we're gonna kick y'all back to the hour, I promise you that. The experimental city of Fairhope that started in 1894 as a single tax colony has endured and blossomed for more than 125 years and is still a vibrant, thriving, growing community today. I wrote that, I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do, and it really told the story of Fairhope really well, from one end to another. And you can come to the museum and we loop it all the time. It's going on at the museum and we sell it in our gift shop. Uh, it goes on and on to the point of where I can say those words over and over and over, day after day after day. And I wasn't really supposed to be in it. Um, uh, the person that was going to be the part that I played wasn't there, and since I wrote it, I knew what to say, and I just stepped right in, and I was in costume, and uh, that put me in there. <clears throat> Actually, uh, the man that played E.B. Gaston, uh, Jerry Fortas over here, he was, he, he fell dead last year for us. I think he just collapsed in his chair, didn't you, you know? It's a good play. Y'all come over to the museum and see it. And also to support it, we have this exhibit. We have the exhibit on uh, the founding of Fairhope. And I don't call it Fairhope Founders because as a matter of fact, of the 28 people that came to town, <clears throat> within a short period of time, most of them had left. Uh, Fairhope wasn't a hospitable place when they came. It was, uh, there were no buildings, there were no trees, uh, there was no water. No electricity, no internet. I mean, they found it to be very, uh, very unfriendly, and some of the older people just wasn't into having to build their homes and dig their wells and, and make the preparations for that, so some of the older, older ones left. Here under, under these, the heading that we have, I'd written these, these cards right here is a, a, a condensing of the history of the founding of Fairhope, and I do that in I try and make things brief because when we're talking to tourists, they'll give you about 15 seconds to get something across. Um, I can explain the single tax colony in 120 words. And, and I do that over and over and over every day. It's, it's a, a haunting that goes on in my brain because I explain the same thing over and over every day. And you have to get good at, um, at doing that. So these words right here, I want you to come in and read them one day, are really cleverly put together to tell the story of Pharaoh. When we were building this exhibit, we 
um, I wanted to use uh, photography. I wanted to use pictures of people, uh, of the founders standing there. I wanted full length pictures of the founders standing there. But unfortunately, in the 19 teens and 20s, when these people were around, they didn't have much photography. They didn't have very good pictures. The ones we have aren't in focus. They all have all kinds of different uh, gradients and grades and, and looks, and I, they just weren't available. I had some you know, good head and shoulder shots, but I just didn't have the pictures to make the, the, uh, the, 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 these, we call them critters, standing there, a little overhead high, and we put them perpendicular to the wall, <clears throat> and then we, we put uh, period wallpaper and period colors in between, and you notice they're in a contrasting color. That's a museum thing. You know, red is opposite of blue, and um, we, we have opposite colors so that the panels will stand out and did different periods of uh, those period wallpapers so that the panels will stand opposite and out of each other. And this is a, a nouveau style. If it was a deco style, all these <clears throat> would have been the same heights, and, uh, but it, it, we did this in a, in a in a nouveau style. We started putting the stories of the people there and of course we have files on all these people and we, we could really say lots of information about them but the idea is just get the main points across. So underneath them you, you can't quite read, see it in this in this illustration but right there is a general summation. His is different. His is right there. Right there and right there is a summation of what that makes that person great and what they did to contribute to Fairhope. Because people who walk around, they go, uh-huh, 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 okay, now we're off to the pier. And you want, you want to get those things across to them fast. And then underneath it are more detailed descriptions about the things they might have done. And then we include a lot of things that these people owned. And we first featured, the, of the first 28 people, we featured about 14 of the first 28 <clears throat> because they're the ones that, that stayed in town. And we used things that belonged to them. This is an actual print of, um, of uh, Frank Brown that was rolled up and wadded up in his barn that we found and spent a good bit of effort on conserving and saving that print from just absolutely rotting away. <clears throat> this is a frame out of his out of his uh, house. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the glass was the original glass, but we broke it in producing this and had to replace the glass. And uh, this is a pillar uh, from his house. So we did that kind of thing with, with these people under their exhibits, putting in items that belong to them, such as E.B. Gaston. We, uh, there's E.B. Gaston's chair. My favorite here is Clarence Marchon. This is Clarence Michon's uh, commode. The thing, your nightstand was called a commode. Uh, this is his, uh, his bowl and pitcher. It, his chamber pot is in that little closet right there. And his Bible is in that, in that little drawer right there. So it it's really means something to have these people's uh, items right there in, in front of them. Over here we have uh, Arthur Michon's that's Arthur Michon's kitchen cabinet. And inside of it, we have some of his original pots and pans. And we, we, we got a lot of uh, Arthur Michon's uh, items because when Dr. Jordan moved into his house, Dr. Jordan took all of his stuff. And, he, and uh, Arthur Michon didn't move out until 1954. And, and uh, Dr. Jordan saved his stuff and labeled it as his and put it out in his barn. And when Dr. Jordan's family was vacating that house, they, here they gave us all this stuff labeled as Arthur Michon's. We were lucky to have that. Right here I have, there's a picture of his house right here. The, his house is down here on Magnolia Avenue. It's the oldest building in town. It was made in 1896. When they made it, he said there were only six other houses in town, and those six houses are gone. So um, he said my house, that's in, uh, in, in 1954 when he was leaving, uh, is the oldest house in town. Right now it's turning on its foundation and they can't keep the utilities hooked up to it. It's very endangered. We're about to lose the oldest house in town. 
why I brought it up, right across from Jewins, that little wooden building across from Jewins is Reese Wainwright's barbershop. He was a black barber who built a barbershop in downtown Farrell and was perfectly welcomed by the single taxers in our town. That house, that old building now, built in 1903 as the first hospital and the black barbershop is slated to be torn down by, by a, 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 a business being about to be established there. You'll see it soon. Okay, we have uh, other things that belong to these, these people. And one thing we did is we took a piece of, and you see I learned from mistakes. Here you can't read that one very well, where some of these others you can read uh, very well, like Mr. Manns, you can sit real well. We took uh, lucite and did rub on white type, almost like reverse type, and rubbed it on that lucite, then mounted it off the wall to catch the light. And we were proud of the way these, uh, the way these turned out. In some of the cases, our museum, we've had a museum for over 20 years, and we're lucky to have a lot of items that belong to a lot of these uh, Fairhope founders. Uh, we, we take a lot of their personal possessions. We keep them at 69 degrees and 35% humidity and uh, are very serious about taking care of these things. The city is very supportive, buying us all the archival supplies we need, helping us maintain a safe storage area for these items that may not be put up in my career time, but will be put up one day. And it's like a time capsule. We're saving these things and launching them into the future. That's one of our main jobs as a, uh, as a curator at the uh, museum. But here in this, we have, um, we have things like a uh, shoe of man's uh, cup with his name on it. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, Mr. Delagreen's, uh, not Delagreen, Mr. Tuvison's shoes. Mr. Tuveson actually wore wooden shoes, and he wore them around the house and working in the yard, and we have several of his shoes, and they're quite worn um, that he, he really wore them, so they weren't just decoration. He actually used these. He was, uh, he was a Scandinavian gentleman. Uh, we have one of the first telephones here, a very deco-style telephone uh, when they started the home telephone system here in uh, 1906, and this uh, tea caddy belonged to um, Corny Gaston, um, Paul Gaston was bringing it next door to give it to uh, me and my wife and dropped it. So, you know, we have a historical break in the top of it there. <clears throat> and this is a shell that belonged to Stuart, the picture man. Miss Roberta was a lady that taught uh, dancing lessons here for many years. I took dance, I took ballroom in the fifth grade. I took tap dance from her in the second grade. She was Stuart the Picture Man's grandniece, and one day he knew he wasn't going to be seeing her much longer, and he said, here. He just grabbed that shell and said, I want to give you something. And uh, before she passed away last year, she gave it to our museum. Uh, this right here, I like this. This is Claire, Claire Gaston, and there's Claire Gaston's glasses, and they look very similar to the glasses that she has on. And her gloves, you can't see very well. And his picture are laying there like um, she just laid them on the edge of the couch. We have um, Clement Coleman's uh, cups here. Uh, we have uh, the Laraway Farm. Uh, there on Laraway Lane was a farm in 1930s before uh, electricity and all was supplied to them. Uh, this is uh, Marietta Johnson's bell, one of her, one of her, one of her class uh, bells. So we have, we have a lot of items like this, and we have three cases of these kind of items, of real personable things that belong to uh, uh, some of our, our major Fairhope founders. Because of the single tax, we have this exhibit. You know, when they came, they were... Um, they, they were populous, and one of their things was to, you know, do uh, means of communication, transportation should be owned by the community. Uh, 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 they should start sub-treasuries, no monopolies. Well, this is their sub-treasury. They started printing their own money when they got here. Uh, they called it scientific currency. Uh, we now call it rubber money. Uh, we now call it counterfeit. You know, try doing that now. But they did. They came and they printed uh, their own money and uh, called them shin plasters. And uh, they were taken through the 
the, uh, the company store, which is a colony cooperative mercantile, which sits where uh, Ben Barnhill's pharmacy sits today. And, and they would go through that, they would go through that store and then they'd turn them over on the back and make notations of every time they, they went through the, the, the store. Uh, they didn't go through the store very often. They didn't last very long. The whole system didn't work very well. <clears throat> After several months, they voted to uh, discontinue their currency and gather it all in. And every month at the uh, single tax meetings, they would announce how much of it they had destroyed. Sometimes it'd be $6 worth, sometimes it'd be up to $30 worth, but little by little, they destroyed uh, these bills. Our museum has one. We have one that somebody finagled from somewhere. It went through the company store twice. And uh, we are very lucky to have it. Well, here the single taxers has been, uh, you know, looking through their archives, doing a wonderful job of, um, of uh, archiving and um, uh, digitizing uh, their collection. Well, they found this money. These right here <clears throat> and our one bill are the only money uh, that we know le this left of the shin plasters. <coughs> These are the, uh, the plates that printed that. I don't know why they weren't destroyed. Somebody hid those. Somebody hid those on purpose to keep them from destroying them. These are war certificates. That's something they did when they came here. They very cleverly financed the wharf by selling wharf certificates. They knew that the wharf was going to be successful, and so they almost sold futures to people who would come and, 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 and buy these wharf certificates and then know they could pay for docking later at a, a cheaper price. We're proud, we're proud of that exhibit. That's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a real good one. And now to our founders. I'm going to run down through uh, some of the... Uh, some of our more important founders, including some of them that, that were on the first boats uh, when they came here. Um, we, we can go on and on about E.B. Gaston. E.B. Gaston, Ernest Berry, B-E-R-R-Y, like a little fruity berry, uh, was really the person behind uh, 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 the founding of Fairhope. My last talk last year here was to show how populism led to single tax. And I thought that was a campaign that I was going to have to carry on and on and wave the banner and harp on and on because the documentation of the first days of Fairhope doesn't mention single tax. My work on this earth is complete. People know that now. Uh, the people who are regularly talking about the history of Fairhope are saying it was found by populists. And uh, E.B. Gaston was a populist. E.B. Gaston did lots of things. Um, he invented a, a snow plow that could be pulled by one mule that would clear a sidewalk. One mule, that was, a, that was something really special at the time. Uh, he was a, a justice of peace. He was a fire chief. He was a real estate agency, a, a real estate agent. He was a developer. Ooh. And he was the secretary of the Iowa State Populist uh, uh, Populist Society Club, what was that word? And uh, the, their, their chief officer was the secretary. So he was the leader of the populist in Iowa. And he was also a great singer, a great baritone singer. He had a great voice, and he was in the, uh, in the Silver Tone Glee Club. And the Silver Tones would travel the state of Iowa, thrilling people with their songs, and then he would get out and pr promote populism and... Uh, and encourage people to open chapters. His goal was to open chapters in every, every town in Iowa. I, I, he, he's our hero. Uh, we could be called Gastonville. He said we ought to be called Manville. Well, we could be called Manville or we could be called Gastonville, but it was uh, his half-sister who actually said, we only have a fair hope of succeeding, but there's more to come. <clears throat> Clara Gaston was uh, at, the, uh, at Drake University where she met E.B. and they were in uh, music programs. We don't think she graduated because there's not records of her graduating from there. I think she fell in love with E.B. and saw no need to go further into education because she had found what she wanted. And uh, she married E.B. Gaston while they were at uh, Drake University. 
She was the strong woman behind a wishy-washy man sometimes, I think. Uh, reading his writings and hearing what she had to say and, and the few things that they recorded about what she did. She was a strong lady. If you look at that picture, doesn't she look like a strong lady? She looks like somebody that could come out in the, in the, uh, in the uh, wilderness with no homes, with, with no, no cars, with, well, only with their one mule, Dolly, and uh, four children, uh, one of them in diapers, and she didn't have any diapers when she got here, and she looks like somebody could swing all that and build her house and make everything work and encourage E.B. Gasson to stay on track. Uh, it, it's a patriarchal world when we look at uh, the, the past, and we don't give credit to women who was, who was in the background making it all happen, and we historically give credit to the men, but I think we can give a whole lot of credit to Clara because she probably helped Fairhope be successful. Frances Lilly was the girl that came without diapers. Okay, this is, I have two pictures of her, and this is, uh, we have several more, we have pictures of her older, only one when she was younger. This is, uh, excuse me, this is Frankie right here. I remember Frankie. I remember her being, uh, she was always in a good mood. She was just, she was delightful. And that's, this right here, this is Spider Gaston. Spider Gaston would take us young people out as teenagers, and he would ski us till our arms fell off. He would ski us till we didn't want to go no more. And he was, he was, he was, he was, he was just wonderful. He would say, all right, we want to go to Clark County and look for fossils. All right, he had Lotus in the car, we'd go to Clark County and look for fossils. And I liked that. He was uh, some Somebody that just would, would give us their time. And, and this is his wife, Mary. Uh, right there is a, one of the few times I didn't see her with a tumbler of bourbon. A tumbler of bourbon, red lipstick, big white teeth, and she was always laughing. And in the morning, we spent the night over their house. We, it, when it was jubileeish, we called it jubileeish when it was looking like a jubilee, we would, um, we would, we would spend the night on their pier. First thing in the morning, she'd come out there with that tumbler of bourbon, just a laughing and just, oh, and let me get y'all boys some breakfast. And she was wonderful. These people were wonderful. They were, they were more up than us serious people seem to be today. <clears throat> Nathaniel Mershon, his house is there on Farrell Avenue. Uh, they just tore the house next door to him down with uh, no conversation whatsoever. They said the, uh, the people that tore down the Dyson house uh, had been in the town just that afternoon when they tore the house down. And uh, am I harking on historic preservation here? Here, here. <clears throat> uh, Nathaniel uh, Mershon, uh, he didn't stay here. Uh, but he was here long enough to start the Michon Brothers store and did lots of things in the early days of Farrell to make things happen. But he, he, he had to go back to um, uh, uh, Iowa, so he went back to Iowa and he died and he was buried there. He was Clarence Michon's father. Uh, Clarence Michon didn't make it on the first boat. Nathaniel, these people I'm listing now, are the people that did come on the first boats. Mary Honnell. We only have a picture of Mary when she was older, and we have about three pictures of her when she was older. She raised two children in Fairhope, and she died here in 1912. She's buried in the Colony Cemetery, and her children went on to marry and raise families here. Uh, it was John Honnell that I played in the cemetery that fell dead. It was John Honnell that was um, out bathing that day and fell dead in the water and and uh, was the first to be buried in the uh, Colony Cemetery. This is a Tuvisons. Uh, Olaf and, um, and his wife, Anna, A-N-A-H, Anna. This is the only picture we have of, 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 of Olaf. Obviously, he was camera shy because we don't have any pictures of him. There are several people that were camera shy. Uh, Marie Howland was camera shy, didn't like cameras. Olaf obviously didn't either. We have no other pictures of him, even in groups. He, 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 didn't, like, he didn't like his picture taken. Um, he was a single taxer. He read about the, 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 uh, the single tax colony when he was in Ohio and brought his wife down on a covered wagon. And they made it here on a covered wagon trip. Most of the people came by railroad and then got on the bay boat and was delivered over here by the James uh, Carney. But, but uh, the uh, Tuvisons, they came by, by, um, by wagon train and... Uh, 
uh, they, they stayed here. Both, uh, both of them are buried here, and there are still lots of Tuvisons left in Fairhope that related to these people. Most of the town founders didn't stay here, and, and a lot of them weren't very, you know, didn't raise big families, and uh, they didn't uh, have, um, didn't leave very many prodigy here in Fairhope. This is a picture of Anna that we have. Uh, her family says, oh, that's her. She was big boned. They describe her as being uh, big boned. And uh, he described, he always kept at least 100 chickens. This is James Ernest. Uh, James Ernest uh, came here and started the uh, Gaston Livery Company. That means horses. And then it became the Gaston Livery Auto. And then it became the Gaston Auto. And it was right there in the middle of town. Uh, what's there now? The PostNet is there on that site now. Even when I was a little boy, that was a pure oil uh, service station where the town clock is, was a pure oil sign up until about 1979, Hurricane Frederick time. But it was um, uh, uh, James that that ran that. He died rather early and turned it all over to, he, he died in 64, but he get, came, became old and an invalid um, and turned it over to uh, uh, Jimmy, his son, uh, uh, Jimmy Jr. He ran the Gaston Motor Company. He's the one that made the decision to move it out to the four lane. Us, us old timers call it the four lane. Now everything's a four lane, but for a long time that was the only four lane in Baldwin County, and we could say the four lane, yeah, everybody knew what we were talking about. And um, he, they moved it out there, and it didn't take long for it to go out of business as most of the uh, car dealerships that did move out there. This is, uh, well, actually, this is Miss Carr right here. Miss Carr was a librarian for a long time, and she was very helpful to children as a young child. Miss Carr was was a wonderful librarian. You loved to see her. When uh, you would come in and you go into the little museum there to see the petrified Indian finger, she just thought that was great. If you came in there, that's just fine. They had the, the, the museum in there. You could probably, I could probably touch the walls now. It was that small, but it was like an amazing place when I was a little boy. It had shrunken heads. It had, in, it had Indian uh, uh, bones. It had uh, uh, snakes in jars of alcohol. Alcohol. It had a shrunken head. It had um, uh, African spears and shields, and it was a really and, and German. I mean, it had a German helmet and German flags, and it was just all. It was very interesting, and we would all we'd do we'd do this to each other about that Indian finger and spook each other with that Indian finger. And when I was building the museum across the street, they say, "Are you gonna have the Indian finger?" Can't have a museum without the old Indian finger. Well, I did. I, I had someone make an Indian finger since it's inappropriate to the exhibit human body parts in museums anymore. But I'm getting to this person right there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Piney Gaston. Piney Woods Gaston. And, uh, and Piney, she, their, their house is... Um, right next door to where the South Alabama is, the old library building, also slated to be destroyed for an apartment building. And, um, and, and his original founder's house is, uh, uh, is where she would play the piano. And, and I lived down the street, not very far from there, and uh, you, she would bang and pound on that piano and sing you know, like, she had a, you know, like there was another person in the house, and there wasn't. Her son was gone, and uh, she sat there and entertained herself, and you could just, you know, before air conditioning, you know, the sounds went across town, and you could just hear her singing, and she was a, just a joyful person. And, of course, she played, and she played uh, for all the, um, the minstrel shows, and she played for the organic school plays, and she played for churches, and you know she was a prolific uh, pianist. We were wondering the other day, you know, in the very first days of Fairhope, when some of the very first families were here and they had just built their first houses, they were known to stand around the piano and sing. So they thought it was important to bring a piano in uh, very early in uh, the days of Fairhope. This is Corny, Cornelius. Uh, we knew him as Corny. I lived, but I lived next door. I bought it. I bought. I bought his, his aunt's house, and I didn't know that. He didn't ever tell me that, um, that I bought Claire Atkinson's house. I lived in Claire Atkinson's house and never knew it. And, uh, and I lived next door to Corny for seven years. And 
he was an old geezer, and uh, he had quit working by then. He had been a chiropractor, and he had run the single tax office for a long time. He had set type in the, uh, for the courier office and was well known around town. But by 1972, when I moved next door to him, uh, he just sat in front of the TV and turned it up so loud I could hear it in my house and because uh, he couldn't hear very well. Not once did we discuss the founding of Fairhope. Opportunity missed. Here I was living next door to uh, an original town founder, and I never discussed it. And we talked lots. Here I had a degree in history. You'd think I would have brought it up. Uh, and, and so here we, uh, um, uh, we talked about all kinds of things. We talked about the bugs and the plants. and uh, we, 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 we hung on the fence and, and, and spent a lot of time together. I liked him. And then during that time, I was going and visiting a lot of older people. And I, I liked spending time uh, talking to older people. One thing he did was rather eccentric is he took string and put a grid all over his yard with string. And when the, uh, when the um, a sycamore tree would drop those great big leaves, he would go out there with a flounder gig and pick up all the leaves in that square and then all the leaves in that square. Skip two down over here and get all the leaves in this square like it's a game show. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure a little Prozac would have uh, taken care of all that. <laughs> anyway, I, I enjoyed living next door to a town founder but never really brought it up. You know. this, is, uh, this is a spider right here as a young man. This is uh, Henry Crawford, Jr. This is Frankie. I remember when she was like that. And this is Mr. Darty. Uh, Ned Darty was a, a, uh, a Spanish-American War veteran and paraded in his Spanish-American War uh, uniform uh, for many years in veterans' parades here in Fairhope. And here they are. They're setting type at the courier. They were running the courier. It was a family uh, business. Uh, Frankie here had married uh, Henry Crawford. And uh, Henry Crawford died, and uh, this, this is their son. These are the other people in Fairhope that, that made it on the first day when uh, Fairhope was founded. And I've got people like uh, the Tuvison, ah, yeah, ah, ooh, ah. and uh, like the Tuvisons, I have them in here. The Smiths, uh, they, they couldn't handle how tough it was. Uh, the powers got in philosophical battles. That's not George you're doing. You're not doing George. And uh, the Della Greens were too old to handle it. Uh, John died young. Jimmy and uh, E.B. Gaston were the only single tax members that, uh, a Feral, not, the Feral Industrial Association members that came and founded our town. Uh, these people right here got involved in a lawsuit against the single taxers because they didn't like the way they were setting up their colony. Going on down to other people that didn't make the first boats but had very much to do with the success of Pharaoh, it would be uh, uh, James Belange. James Belange, it is, uh, we, we don't know, but it, it is said, Paul Gaston says that he introduced the single tax idea to E.B. Gaston after his uh, colony, his um, American colony in, in St. Charles, Louisiana failed. He said, well, why not try this single tax idea? And uh, it was him that took him to Mr. Morphy's Single Tax Club. Mr. Morphy never lived here, but he ran the Single Tax Club. Uh, it's also said that the Des Moines Single Tax Club had nothing to do with the organizing of Fairhope. She was a straight man, had everything to do with organizing the colony of Fairhope. He was one of the first members to join the Fairhope, single, the, the Fairhope Industrial Association. Uh, he promoted Fairhope all over the country. He had a son named Thomas Early, and Thomas Early uh, ran for a state senator and promoted Fairhope all over the time when he was running for a state senator. Uh, the th two things that, that, known, that, that Mr. Mann's known for is that he found helped found the site, him and Mr. Belange were on the founding committee to come here and found the site of Fairhope and help pick out the site of Fairhope and promote it so that everybody would vote for this site of Fairhope. And that also that in his later years, uh, just a few years before he died, he procured a whole lot of land out to the east of, of uh, the single tax colony and gave that to the single taxers and doubled the size of the single tax colony, which doubled their income, which made them more successful. Uh, 
E.B. Gaston wrote a letter. We have a copy of it over in the museum. Actually, I have the original over in the museum that says, Why, for what y'all have done for our town, we ought to call this town Manville. <clears throat> Frank Brown came to town and did all sorts of stuff. He, he ground rice. He was a watchmaker. He would fix your teeth. Uh, he, 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 uh, uh, he started a sawmill. He has a brick machine. The brick machine we have in the museum, that was his. He started the first, he said the first industry in 1904 was uh, his brick machine. It's only about that big. And um, uh, he, he designed the, 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 the Bay Boat Fairhope. He designed the People's Railroad, but he fell in love with clay. Out there in front of the bowling alley used to be a pond. If you've been here a while, been here a while you'll know there was a pond in front of the bowling alley. That was his barrel pit where he first started making uh, pottery and bricks. And then he went out and bought the Clay City site in 1915, and in 1916 fired the kiln out there uh, in Clay City and started Clay City Tile. And the Brown family... Um, uh, and the Jennings family still live out there and benefit from uh, what Frank Brown did. <clears throat> Marie Howland, um, she uh, had a wonderful history, and she just danced around the world. She was just a bohemian, living a wild lifestyle, uh, met other people that was part of her wild lifestyle, and she brought that wild lifestyle to uh, Fairhope. And we, we have some really detailed stuff of what she did and where she went and who she was converting with and, and what their parties were doing and all that. And, uh, and she came here with 1,200 books <clears throat> and started uh, this library, the first library in the state of Alabama. And she built it onto her home. And it was the first library building in the state of Alabama. Uh, Tusc Tuscaloosa claims when they were the capital, they had the first library because they had a, a box. And the box had a, a, a index card in it. And when you borrowed a book, you wrote on the index card and put the Put, put that, and they said that was the first borrowing library. But she had the first standing building, much larger than that box of books uh, that began with. And in 1925, they built that concrete facade on it that you see now on the University of South Alabama building that, um, uh, for the 21st anniversary of that first uh, library in the state. She was camera shy. In this picture, she's looking at you like, don't you take my picture, you birdie, yo birdie. And she, we have very few pictures of her. We have a drawing and about three other pictures are all this known of, of uh, Marie Howland. Uh, we have her books now in our museum. We keep them at 69 degrees and 35% humidity, comfortably resting on their sides. And inside that box is uh, like the inside those with those books came to us the first card catalog to the first library in Alabama and the card catalog for the Topola Bampo library which is just has extraordinary history of the Topola Bampo colony in it in our Marie Howland exhibit we have uh, a lot of these prints Marie Howland uh, collected uh, historical prints which are a beautiful collection and uh, then we have, we have these pictures right here of, of her, and that's the drawing of her, of uh, these pictures right here, her and Edward in um, Tabola Bampo, uh, Mexico. And these are the best pictures of her. And we bought these from the University of California in Fresno. That right there is the best picture of a young and beautiful um, Marie Howlin. Um, uh, and, and, Ellen was a freed slave that lived on the top of Sea Cliff. She went down to the Fairhope Yacht Club and collected nickels and pennies from the people that crossed the footbridge down there for money. She was known to fry chickens on halves. You steal chickens and she would, uh, she would, she would fry them and, and, and cut them in half for you. Uh, you. She took half and you took half. She had a daughter named Sally. Aunt Sally stood, 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 took right to her role and uh, Aunt Sally became um, uh, Aunt Ellen, and it was up until the 1940s, Aunt Sally was still around doing the same thing that Aunt Ellen did. Real town characters, they called them uh, Fairhope celebrities. Uh, Frank Stewart was what you call the picture man. If you look at this picture, he was blind in one eye. Can you guess which eye he was blind in? Just today, I sent my book that I've been writing on Frank Stewart for three years. 
Years I have labored on writing this book on Frank Stewart. I started researching him in, in um, 1995 by interviewing all the family that were living then. And uh, just today, I sent my book off to the publisher. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's a good feeling. That's a real good feeling. It's like getting off the horse and he didn't throw you. It feels good. It feels real good. So I don't know anything about him. I'll save it for another program. OK, um, uh, Clarence Michon. C.L. Mershon, you know they had a bad habit of calling people by their initials, E.B. Gaston, C.L. Mershon. Um, uh, you know, they, they, and so often we don't know what their names are. Well, in the papers of uh, C.L. Mershon uh, Jr., I found a legal document that said Clarence Leoma. Leoma, his name was Leoma. Uh, we have uh, several things that belong to him. And um, he was the first doctor in town, what is notorious for making the first telephone system here. He strung up iron bailing wire and strung it all the way to Montrose so he could talk to his patients. Point Clear and Montrose, that's how far that phone system went. Alfonso Swift um, had, um, had purchased the track down there on um, uh, Atkinson Lane, and his house is the one at the end of Atkinson Lane that faces the bay. It was before there was any roads there. His house was built to face the bay there. Uh, Bayview was a little dirt road in front of him, so his house was on Bayview uh, facing the bay. And it was owned by a Charles and uh, Minnie Skelkenback. And the Skelkenbacks had bought that track before uh, Farrell was Farrell. Uh, five months they had bought that, about the same time that uh, Charles Nichols bought uh, his land. And I found the legal documents we had in our papers where Skelkenback sold it to Clara Atkinson. And I don't know why they called it the Swift track instead of the Atkinson track. That will something I will have to ferret out and figure out one day and keep researching. Uh, Lydia Cummings uh, helped start the organic school. Uh, Lydia Cummings helped start the, also uh, the librarian. She was a librarian, stepped in to take Marie Holland's place for many years. Uh, she lived to be 96 and worked until she was 94. And uh, she, she did, we have her Indian clubs. She started uh, exercises. Uh, said children would do better, postulated that they would do better if they did physical exercises, and we have our Indian clubs that uh, the organic school gave to our museum. I could go on about her also. Uh, Mr. Berglund's son was uh, one of my father's big drinking buddies, and on Sunday morning, my father would let us get out of Sunday school, and we would go to the Berglund's ice cream plant and eat all the ice cream we wanted. Why, they drank all the bourbon they wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> Arthur Michon um, uh, came about four years after Ferrop got started. He was promoted to come here. It uh, wasn't four years. It was four, five, it was two and a half years. And uh, he was promoted to come here to be the town's first postmaster because it's real important to get the post office in Ferrop because the Ferrop courier is being delivered by the uh, by the. Uh, by the uh, post office. Marietta Johnson um, uh, read in the Fairhope Courier uh, when she was in Minnesota and thought that would be the place I could try my experimental school. Those people down there would probably accept my different ways and ideas of education and came here and started the, uh, the, the organic school. We now call it the Marietta Johnson School of Organic Education and it's doing real well down on uh, South Section Street, uh, a little bit past the, um, the uh, Catholic Church uh, down Pecan Street. Uh, they, that school's been growing this past year and we're real proud of the organic school. Uh, Harris Greeno was a kicker. You saw that in the movie. Uh, he came here uh, because he was a, a Henry Georgist, and he got here and said, y'all not doing George. Y'all not doing George. Y'all doing something else. And there's lots of differences. He also didn't like it because they let women vote. Here, when E.B. Gaston came, they let women were members, just like the men were, and all the women, the day one, had, had the vote. And uh, he thought that was just, he thought that was ridiculous. And, uh, and this is when they, they, they formed the, the, the Fairhope 
city council. This is the first mayor, and it was a single taxer who started the city of Fairhope, started the mayor town council form of government. Uh, so many people had moved in, they needed, they needed some relief because so many people were taking advantage of the single taxer supplying you know, fire and, and police service and all that. And so they, 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 the single taxers actually started the, uh, the uh, town of Fairhope. And uh, Mr. Pilcher, he wrote the song Fair Hope. That's uh, 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 Mr. Belange. Uh, that's Mr. Sweet. Uh, this is um, uh, Clement Lefebvre Coleman. Uh, this is Charles Nichols, who started Nicholsville. We now, now, now know it's the fruit and nut section. And, uh, and uh, this is Mr. Albright. Boo. He was, was anti-single tax and fought him the whole time. Uh, he was part of the lawsuits, part of the monitor. They had a newspaper called The Monitor to monitor the annex of those single taxers. And he was part of that. And then we have, uh, whoops, and then we have uh, Nathaniel Mershon. Okay, then we have, uh, in our next slide, we have Clement Lefebvre Coleman. Uh, he, was, um, he was born in Canada, but he was American, right, Flo? And uh, Flo shouts me down if I say he's Canadian even though he was born in Canada. And uh, this is very appropriate for him to have a horticultural knife and a plant there about to do an operation on it because he prided himself as being a horticulturalist. He came here and ran the uh, Colony Cooperative Mercantile. He's the one that took those shin plasters. He's the one that went to Mobile using Yankee dollars to buy goods and, goods and bringing them back and selling them for the shin plasters. Bad business model. It didn't work. Well, and then E.B. Gaston uh, had the audacity to bash him in the newspapers and uh, so that made him mad and he's the one that went out and put that curve in Fairhope Avenue and, and started that subdivision out there purposefully selling land cheaper than they were renting it downtown and uh, but still then uh, still took part in in single tax uh, activities uh, he has uh, he has two granddaughters that are here in Fairhope now who have lots of, he wrote a book, he wrote a book, it's called uh, Educated Fools, and in that book he changes the names of all the people. He says the town is, uh, is Fairmont, and he changes the names of all the people. It is the most detailed description of what was happening those first days, but because he changed the name, um, it's, a, it's a shame, it's, uh, you know, it's just it's folklore now, because he changed the names that we don't know who he's talking about, and that wasn't a good thing to do. I, I, I'm, I'm a historian. I, I, it's great history lost because he was afraid it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. And they were all going to be dead in a few years anyway. It wouldn't make any difference. Uh, Oswald Forrester uh, bought into uh, Nicholsville, bought into uh, down there where um, Pierce Street is, and um, built a house there. Uh, it burned in the 1930s, in 1936, and along with his wharf. Uh, this is his son's. Uh, these are the sons, Forrester and Sons. They're the ones that built houses all over the town. Built the um, the the um, the Claire Atkinson house that I lived in, and built the museum. Uh, they they had a they, they 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 put the concrete facade on the front of the uh, of the museum of the uh, library also the old library now uh, USA business. I'm starting to talk fast because I'm running out of time. And we have uh, John Bowen. John Bowen's house is down at the end of Summit Street. <clears throat> the lady um, uh, uh, who, who owns it now still has his stuff in the closet and his, and his pictures on the wall and protects it and saves it. And talk about preservation. It looks just like he did when he went off and left it. And um, the Logston family is trying to buy all that now. Sylvia Logston was a Bowen, and, and they're... they're, they're about to buy it. Just yesterday, Lila Riles told me she's about to sell her house to uh, the, the Bowen family, which is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Claire Atkinson, that was uh, E.B. Gaston's half-sister. She's the one that thought he was this wild dreamer and said, you know, you know, it's just a fair hope of success. And that wasn't, it's just a fair hope. And uh, she took credit for it. Alf Wooster, who was also the publisher of the Farmer's Tribune, he claimed that he thought of that too. So it's kind of a toss up as to who actually thought of the name Fair Hope. And then our last slide here is uh, John Hunnell. And uh, John Hunnell was uh, not a single taxer, and he came to town, but he, he got in on the new business of town. Our new business and our first business to take off, our first industry, was tourism. And in the very first days, John Hunnell went out and built 
looked like outhouses and painted numbers on the doors and uh, started renting uh, outhouses or renting um, bathhouses to people who wanted to come here and enjoy our salubrious climate. 